welcome all of you guys online and all of you ladies that will be watching later or snuck in today. This will be a session that I believe will be one we'll re reference and come back to because of its own equipping and prayer time. So we're going to have time together each session as we go through the five, six sessions of prayer that Jesus taught us. All righty. Has everybody, has everybody received a copy of Teach Us to Pray? Yes? If you have not, we want to make sure you have one in a moment. Uh, and for those of you online, I am, did not get it on a PDF yet, but if you're watching at a later date, go to our website. We will put this up as a PDF so you can reference it from wherever you are, wherever you live, at whatever time. But as far as this first day, and if you are online, we will have more of these, uh, and you're live with us, they're, they'll be available tomorrow morning in service. So please make sure you take, uh, take time to get this. This book was written a number of years ago, but we'll talk about that in a second. I want to read Luke 11, verse 1. I've asked Pascal. He's a blessed brother, and uh, we've had a lot of time together in prayer these last few months in the sanctuary on our Wednesday prayer. And I asked if he would help us by allowing us to center our heart in worship with the Lord's Prayer. But first, let me read it so we can embrace it. And let's see the setting in which it was taught. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. As a rabbi, he modeled what became obvious, and the only question ever recorded of the disciples asking to be taught how to, or to do, more importantly, not how to, but to pray, not how to pray, but teach us to pray, was this one question. Because they had watched and seen the obvious. That prayer preceded everything Jesus did. Every preaching, every miracle, every power demonstration. So they said, teach us to pray. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's go ahead and say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Luke forgot that part, but Matthew's got it in there. All right. Okay, because we want to make this interactive, I want to get us into some small practice groups. And uh, for those of online, we will be a practice group together. So I've asked a number of men we, and got them just enough familiar with how we're going to work this service with, to uh, be kind of group leaders. So would you guys stand up so then we'll formulate our groups? It's nothing... Uh, those of you that are, have, okay, so these guys standing, they know what they're doing. No, <laughs> we don't know what we're doing, but we, we, have a, we have a feel to, com so what I'd like to do is, can we get like groups of three centered around, just go find one of these guys, or you guys find a couple, and pull together, and you can make little circles with your chairs, we'll, remember, we'll fix the chairs after, for Sunday. But we're just going to get it. Once we've got everybody, and don't lead anybody out. So if you're seeing someone, don't be shy. Again, you guys online, we're going to be doing the same thing together. Uh, so you stay with me because each of these. But let's get everybody, groups of three. Well, there's some people over here. Richard, Richard, way over there. Gentleman standing right on there by himself. I want every. Go, 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 yeah. Or Darren, yeah. Yeah, let's. When you've got a group of three, or Pascal, there's over there, yeah, right over here, there's a couple. Right there, grab, keep everybody connected. It's going to make such a big difference because if we have a chance to practice, the whole point is to go home 
and be able to do this on your own. And if we can have a group of three, try not to get bigger than three because then we have enough time each time we do the, the, prayer, the prayer practice. All right, once, you, once you've got yourself a group, sit down, and then I'll know we, we're, we were, we're settled. And then I'll, I'll, I'll call everybody's attention one more time up here, and then we'll, we'll start moving this. It should be good. And again, I apologize, but later these, this will be on, on our website as a PDF, so if you're watching at a later time, you can go and follow with us. So... Uh, yeah, we're getting everybody, once, you, once you've got a group, sit down, so I know you're well settled. Got groups. Remember, that's why Jesus, before he could do the miracle of the fish and bread, he had to have everybody get into groups and had to get them to sit down. So whatever reason, before the miracle happens, we've got to get, get, get in our group and sit down. So once I've got everybody in a group, and they'll see, all right. So you have a book, and I'm going to read the introduction. Uh, because it'll just help explain it faster than if I was to try to explain it. This book is called Teach Us to Pray. I wrote it in uh, last, was uh, 2001, 2002 I should say. Teach Us to Pray is a study in our Lord's response to his disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, 2,000 years later, his disciples are still asking, Lord, teach us to pray. My own journey began over 25 years ago, but putting the math on, it's really 45 years now. When as a new believer, I found myself spending hours alone seeking God in the remote areas of Thousand Oaks, California, as well as early morning prayer with other brothers, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Then I moved to Ventura and used the top of an old Victorian house or the railroad tracks or the beach as my secret place. From there I moved to Idaho and I found snow-covered roads where I would pray until my feet got too cold. Or in the bathroom of the studio apartment that I shared with two other guys. In the summer, the streams of the small and the small hill overlooking the market where I worked became my favorite places of, to pray. I also began to read about prayer from others who had gone before me. E.M. Bounds, Praying Hyde, Brother Lawrence, and others. This only increased my appetite. I prayed in the morning, but woke up my roommates. So I had to learn to find that secret place where I could meet with God, but not disturb others. After Cammie and I got married, I found early morning walks from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. provided me the time to pray and not interfere with the family, although I was tired at times. By the time we started Jubilee Church in September 1984, I was a practicing praying disciple. I was determined that Jubilee would be a house of prayer. Besides our Sunday services and the banquet hall of a pizza place, our first meetings were a men's prayer meeting held on Friday mornings at 6 a.m. at a member's house. When we leased our first building in Santa Rosa Plaza, we immediately began early morning prayer, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. It was around this time that I came across a teaching by Dr. Larry Lee, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? From this teaching, I made many life-changing discoveries in the art of prayer. I say art because prayer is certainly not a science. For as we commune with the creator of the universe, we often, he often supersedes many of his own rules as he imparts grace. Dr. Lee taught that the Lord's Prayer was not meant to be a 30-second recital, but an outline. And the outline contains a plan to pray that was taught by Jesus. The outline was broken into six parts, with each part addressing important aspects of our walk with him. For me, the most revolutionary Thing in this outline was found in part two. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dr. Lee taught me to pray my priorities. Up until this time, I prayed my opportunities or problems, whatever excited me or most irritated me. I discovered the hard way that this hit and miss approach left things not covered until they affected me. 
Once I began to practice the Lord's Prayer, stability, soundness, and strength came to me as integrity increased in every area of my life, my secret life, my married life, my family life, my church life, and my work, simply because I remembered to pray for all of them. At the same time, I heard Pastor Jack Hayford say, some people are not mentioned in heaven because no one mentions them on earth in prayer. This challenged me to mention my family and extended family members every time I prayed. The Apostle Paul said, always in every prayer of mine, making mention of you all with joy. Much of what is in this pamphlet I have discovered as I practiced the outline of Dr. Larry Lee gave. The Holy Spirit's sessions of life and his workings have expanded upon his outline found in the Lord's Prayer, and this is by no means a finished product. I continue to discover new things in prayer, and the prayer emphasis changes to keep up with God. But the simple steps in prayer that Jesus taught his disciples remain consistent. Recently, while I was teaching this method of prayer to a group of about 20 people on a Tuesday morning, I realized that what was so needed is constant prayer. Not conformity, but consistency. Constant, continual prayer. An Olympic athlete excels through constant practice, and you'll excel as you practice prayer. Jesus' disciples did not ask him to teach them how to pray, but simply to pray. And may all, that also be our request as we follow the Lord together. I was thinking this morning as I was reviewing this again, you know, it says without faith it is impossible to please him and that he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of us who diligently seek him. So the practice of faith is coming to God and the reason we come to God is we believe he is God and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So that's where we're positioning ourselves to do today. So I'm going to read one more portion and then uh, we will start practicing ourselves. This is about just kind of finding the place. In the book, every time there, there's a, there is a table of contents, so if you're, when we jump into one section, you can jump back to the table of contents and find where we are, but it's not very complicated. Finding the place. Prayer, prayer involves space and time. This involves a set hour which we have been committing ourselves to practice five days a week. And it, we'll find that when we create a time, it's like work. We don't go to work when we feel like it. We go to work because a time was set. And prayer has to be started as a discipline. It begins with a desire. Then it has to, and we have to find the discipline of it. And after the discipline, it will become a delight. And it will be the most favorite part of the day that you'll long for, and it won't even be a part to try to fit, fit into a busy schedule. Jesus' ministry is, was prayer-based. He modeled for us the value of consistent prayer. He lived a life of constant prayer. And from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see prayer being central. Now, in this booklet, you'll find that I, I print out many scriptures because I want this to be for anyone, you could go and practice prayer, and not, if you don't know what to do in the, at the portion you're in, you will have a lot of scriptures to go explore, and uh, then grow the sound for yourself. So here is a key. This begins in Mark 1. You, when you read chapter 1 of Mark, you see Jesus in the beginning of ministry at the most expansive long day you could imagine. He starts early in the morning, goes to late at night. He casts out devils. He releases the, the word in the synagogue. He brings a crowd to people at night. They've heard about him, and they keep bringing the sick and the oppressed. And so into the late hours of night, he's ministering. The next morning, the disciples can't find him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, so this was the next morning, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Each one of these scriptures that I insert has a story behind it. 
And when you find one of them by the Spirit of God that quickens, wow, what? That was a whole day and that's how we began the next day? Go there and let the scripture begin to become a foundation or truth that gives the faith to do what is going to be required of each of us. Because it says, however, uh, the report about him went out more and more and great multitudes came together to hear. And so he healed and to be healed by them in his infirmities, of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. The busier Jesus got, the more he prayed. And if he did that, how much more will we have to? Jesus prayed to the extent, think about this. He's a man. He's not Superman. He's a man like you and me, except without sin, pure connected, united spirit to Father. But he has a soul like we have a soul. And he lives in a body like we live in a body. And he's feeling all the impact of the world like we are, but without sin. He's walking with the Father to a destination to die for our sin as a spotless sacrifice to sustain this place with Father in a hostile environment that is constantly rejecting him and attacking him and cursing his identity. He builds a place of prayer to the extent that he only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he heard the Father say. He only judged as the Father judged. He became one with the Father. Our life is to become one with Jesus and to identify ourselves inside of Christ so that inside of Christ is who I am, is my truth is my point of reference, is where I begin my day, not where I try to get my day to. Accepting all that Christ has accomplished for eternity for me. That Father accomplished with his Son on the cross and then raised him from the dead. Now my faith, believing, opens the door for me to be dwell in him, him be over me, and to live out a, an abundant life. But it is as, trust me, and you know this, men, it is hard because the warfare against us is the same warfare that was against Jesus and the rejection and the conflict and the challenging of identity is the same that was going against Jesus the good news is we're not trying not to sin thank you Jesus we're trying to abide in Jesus that's all our goal is but it, it's still the same intentionality of going well I feel like this and I'm thinking these thoughts, and I'm really having a hard place over here. But I'm not going to start here. I'm going to start today in Christ. And I'm going to praise him for who he is. Until who he is, I start feeling. And that's our challenge. And once that begins to grow, we will say, like Jesus, in the last days, we will say, if you've seen Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Son. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, we will say the body of Jesus. If you've seen us, you've seen the Son. Paul got to the point where he would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Prayer is the, pr the practice. Prayer is the method. Prayer is the way. So I left a bunch of scriptures that I won't go to. But let me, on the page 8, <clears throat> this is the night of his betrayal in Gethsemane. We are all familiar with the time. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. And as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Here are the two secrets of Jesus' life. As he was accustomed. That means Jesus made it a habit. Whenever in Jerusalem, over there in Gethsemane, he could find a secret place. He could find a place of communion. Out from the hustle and bustle of the religious system of the temple, he separated and he would find a place to pray. He was his custom. And when he came to the place, he knew that garden so well. He had a favorite olive tree. He had a favorite place. He didn't go meander. He, that's what prayer does. Consistent prayer will build altars in our, into our lives and the place of prayer. Finding a place is our practice. 
ask yourself, where do I, where and when do I meet God best? In church, at home, on a walk, kneeling, standing, in the morning, at night. Through constant practice, you discover a place of prayer and you build an altar. Altars will change during seasons with God. So don't feel the necessity once you're in a place that you have to stay in that place. You stay in that place as long as it's releasing rich dividends of intimacy and connectivity. But then you'll find a time where God says, come on over here. It may be a different posture, a different practice. Uh, all of us probably can think of at times when we met God here or met God this way. Those practices are the is the building of altars, but be free to go to the next season as Abraham did. Places of prayer change with seasons. When the Lord appeared to Abram, verse, uh, he said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from the mountain east of Bethel. The altar is where we, we pause and say, that was really real. It's time to secure that practice, that word and that promise. And so he moves to Bethel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And when he went on his journey to the south as far as Bethel, he, uh, the, at, as the beginning, to a place, the altar which he had made there first. Altars are powerful because if a place of prayer is practiced and a, a, an encounter with God is recognized, you can return there any time. When the famine came into the land and Abram, without consenting and asking God, what do I do? He just went to Egypt because there was a place of safety, but it got him into trouble. But he got out of the trouble because God brings us always out of trouble. But when he comes back, he goes right back to the altar and calls upon the Lord. So an altar is not just a place of building prayer because God's speaking, but it's a place to return to what God was saying and call on his name. So uh, he built his altar. I love this little statement. I heard Ed Cole say this years and years ago. It's Genesis 13, 18. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Abraham pitched his tent and built an altar. And what I heard Ed Cole say is most men... They build their tent and pitch their altar. What is permanent is the place of prayer. A hundred years from now, nothing on this planet will matter. But what we built in the, inside the Christ and what we have established inside of those encounters will be all of eternity for us. So the building of the altar is, shows you this permanence. The pitching of the tent means we're in a temporary transition. So Daniel did the same. You know the story that when it came time to try to take Daniel out of, out of his position out because of the jealousy of others, they made it illegal to pray. So when he heard of the test that it was illegal to pray, the first thing he did is he went up into his room, opened the windows big and wide, and, and knelt down and began to pray in, in the direction of Jerusalem. And the place of his consistent prayer gave him the confidence to pray through the persecution that was coming. When they throw him in the lion's den, the king says, oh Daniel, may the God you serve consistently or, per or constantly save you. That night, the king wouldn't eat, he wouldn't drink, he wouldn't have any entertainment. He spent his night praying. When he woke up that morning, he ran to the, to the, to the lion's den and said, are you, was the God you serve constantly able to save you. And he said, oh, king, live forever. Lord, send an angel and shut the mouth of the lion. A life of prayer will be the place that will be the peace that will sustain us in a crisis. A crisis will lead us into prayer and, and, and rob us of a night of sleep. But a practicing of prayer will allow us to sleep in the midst of a crisis. That's the beauty of building that consistency in the altar. Okay, so now we're going to get into our interactive part. And this is where what we'd like to do is there's six sections of prayer. And each one of them 
enlarged ideas of where you might practice the idea. Like, for instance, when you pray, our Father in heaven, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Page 12. The first part of prayer, if this is just the beginning, is Jesus said, say. That tells me prayer involves the heart and the mouth. You have to hear yourself. If you do, you praying in our mind when we have no opportunity to be out loud is, but thank God, you know, with the pandemic, you can just put your mask on, pray as much as you want. <laughs> Nobody knows. Your mouth is your steering wheel. Where your mouth goes, your mind will follow. So you have to engage the mouth. So that's why Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So here's where we'll practice this idea. And I give you three, three, three ways. You know, hallowed, hallowed means make him holy and uh, uh, enlarge and uh, enamor and ex exalt his name. Our Father, my Father. The men who are, we prayed earlier to, before today, right there is a, a first connection, intimacy. Our Father, my Father, Father, hallowed be your name. So how do you hallow his name? There's uh, three ideas, and I have now three, three more since the time I wrote this book, that I, but I won't go to those. The simple one is they were called the covenant names of God. As God began to reveal himself to beginning with Abram and on through the, through the Bible to Israel, when he would demonstrate himself in a certain way, then it would be referred to as Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah our righteousness, or Jehovah Mekedesh, the Jehovah who sanctifies. Jehovah means self-existent one, the, the God. When he showed himself, like on the mountain of Moriah, when Abram, Abraham had been told to sacrifice Isaac, and instead God gave him the ram in the thicket, he called Upon he called the mountain and called the Lord Jehovah Jireh because the Lord sees or the Lord is the provider. So I would spend, and this was a really, I would just use all of these. I would just take a moment and say, Lord, I want to thank you. Hallowed be your name. You are Jehovah Sidkenu, my righteousness. Pause. Think, what does that mean? How, do I, how does that make me feel? How would I respond knowing that he is my righteousness? So there is like um, 12 or 8 or so of these names. And again, this is meant for us to take home and practice on our own. Another place is a simple proclamation that God gave of himself to Moses in Exodus 34. It's the proclaimed name of God. God Moses said, show me your glory in Exodus 33. And he said, okay, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord. Then the goodness of God is linked into the proclamation of his name. In other words, goodness apart from his name, his name is who he is. When he said, I want to see your glory, he said, okay, I'll tell you my name. This name is yet to be ever mined for the fullness of the wealth of freedom and light. He comes down and he comes in and he proclaims the name of the Lord. And he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgressions and sins, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That can be a powerful daily proclamation but you take time and let the words come out of your mouth with your heart believing believing isn't that you are actually having the faith of it it's that you're accepting the revelation of it as truth in other words my day might be anything from a merciful gracious God in my life but I'd rather declare God to be merciful and gracious in the face of opposition and awfulness because otherwise, my circumstances will define who God is. But if I will declare who he says he is, 
he will define my circumstances. He will override it. So that was another one. Uh, David's favorite chorus. And then there's a whole section. This was right where I was at that 2001, 1999 to 2000. In the book of Revelation is the glory that's given in heaven. And it's found in chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 15, and chapter 19. And what they are is recorded worship sessions. It'd be like recording a worship session on earth, but these were recorded in heaven. John heard them, wrote them down. And they're progressive because what you'll find in heaven, and this is so cool, and yet it is so demanding on our soul and our flesh that often we will refuse to keep going into the revelation of who he is. When God shows up, he does not explode things. He implodes things. He is so great that everything around him collapses at his feet. Everything implodes. So when, worship, when revelation of God's happening, so if I'm hallowing his name, I will start to feel the weight of his glory and want to yield to who he is and bow before him. It's so, it's so simple. So the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the proclamation first of the holy creator, what do they do? They all fall down and throw their crowns. And they say, holy, holy, holy. They say, you are worthy to... Re you know what he says... Uh, holy, holy, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Then comes the revelation of the Lamb and now you are worthy because you have redeemed us. So the re revelation of the Savior. Then in chapter 7, we begin to see him as the revelation of the shepherd that's caring for his people in the midst of the heavenly realm even while we're living on an earthly path. Then in chapter 11, you see Jesus the judge beginning to operate, which is what we're experiencing today in life, and probably is going to increase greatly because he will take all of the nations for himself and become all nations and all kingdoms his. Chapter 15 is the, is the revelation of the overcomers, and we sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And then chapter 19 is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So... Those have the possibility of, of anthems and experiences, and, and um, they're, they're all recorded here. So now that I've explained three ideas, none of them are the one you have to use, but we're going to take a moment and start our prayer time by saying, gathering together, and each person will take a moment, and we'll take five minutes so we stay ahead of ourselves inside our circle. How, Father, hallowed be your name. And then add to that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are my righteousness. You are my joy. You are merciful. You are gracious. You can take a portion and just read it. It's really nothing, nothing that originates on our own is as important as what originates from his word. So it can just be a moment. But let's practice that. And then while we're doing that, I will be doing it. I'll, go, I'll get off the, out of the system so you won't hear me, and we can all pray. So let's go ahead, leaders, gather your guys, and let's take the next five minutes and start the prayer time. Okay, men and women, whoever is joining me, we are thrilled <laughs> to be together. And here is the way we begin prayer. Doesn't have to sound exactly like this, but it is recognizing we're praying to the Father in Jesus' name, and he is our Father. Hallowed be your name. To take the name of God, which is a refuge, a fortress, which is all that Jesus is for us, is the beauty of building, lifting him up. Hallowed be your name. You are my righteousness. You are my sanctification. You are the God who sees. Every time I find a point of reference to worship, I often discover that it's more than I saw the last time. So I never try to go from where I am. I have to return. For instance, 
Jehovah Jireh. I was recently at that. And I saw that Daira means the God who sees. Yes, he is a provider, but he sees. And then I read it further. It says, he who sees will see to it. So Lord, Father, you are the God who sees. And you'll see to it. You'll bring the provision wherever I am in need. You will be the provision for whatever I need. You have given your son Jesus as my provision in all things. I hallow your name, Father. Father, you are my joy. You are my help. You are the God. Your goodness is attached inside of your name. And so as you spoke to Moses, as you passed before him and made all of your goodness pass before him in the proclamation of your name, you said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Oh, merciful. I let mercy roll out of my mouth and let my heart swell. Mercy means that you are compassionate, have a disposition that you pick me up and hold me and fondle me like a little child. Carry me, pull me into your bosom. You are merciful. And you are uh, merciful, gracious. Gracious means that you'll stoop down and you'll help me. Your, your, your kindness is in disposition. You're ready to be a part of me. Of course, this is the goodness of Father. Father, you are so good. Merciful. Gracious. Merciful. Gracious. Mm. You help. You love. Long-suffering. Oh, I am so grateful when I started to see through the scripture that one of the key elements of all of salvation and of who you are is that you suffer long. You can keep going. You don't just abruptly end and leave us to ourselves. You just continue to overextend and extend and extend for long-suffering is salvation. You are long-suffering. Abounding in goodness and truth. I always marvel that you want to make it clear to us as you passed by Moses proclaiming your name. This was a self-proclamation of you to Moses that you abound in goodness and truth. You abound in goodness to each of us and truth. Abounding in goodness and truth. You keep mercy thousands mercy to thousands imagine that thousands of generations extend from the point of declaration we are told that you have the sure mercies of David Jesus the resurrected man called to be Messiah has the sure mercies of David David's mercies were given to him and promised that his seed of his flesh Christ would come and dwell on his, on his throne. Assure mercies. And mercies to thousands of generations. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins. This is the beauty of our relationship. We'll never, it will always enlarge further and further at this point. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins. Yet, in no wise, no way, will you, will you, no way, forget cleansing the iniquity. Say, I get elaborating and I lose the way the phrasing is, which is totally perfect. In, in no means will you, you cleanse the guilty, but you visit the iniquity of third and fourth generation. Why would a God choose to allow a sin to stay affecting people? Because he's a deliverer. He's not a whitewasher. He's a liberator. And if I can't see it, I can't confess it. If I can't acknowledge I'm stuck, then I just live stuck thinking somebody else has stuck me. That's who you are, God. That's Halloween, the Father's name. So, session two, teach us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Priorities. God's priorities are his kingdom, his will. It's the only kingdom that he cares about. And it's the only will that he will respond to. So we pray, as Jesus taught, 
your kingdom, Father, your will be done. First, my priorities that I learned, my first priority is my relationship with God. This is what I want to be as close and secure as possible. Then my relationship to my wife, because I, this is the next covenant. If we break covenant there, our prayers are hindered anyway. Then with my children, and as you know, children are your children forever. They don't, they don't go, even though they move, get married, have grandkids, they're still your kids. Relationship with my extended family, because I think God looks into covenant and he sees families. And our relationship with our church family. This may seem odd, but it's true. Your relationship within the church of the Lord Jesus is more important than your relationship with your job. Because your job is a temporary assignment. Church is a forever relationship. So we pray for our church, and then we pray for our job. Now, just taking that as a list, we have an opportunity to touch each one of those in prayer. If we're not married, it's really the same, except you, you, instead of your spouse, you can pray for your spouse that's coming, and pray for your family, your parents, the authority over you. When you pray, uh, what is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So for instance, when I would say your kingdom come, your will be done, I say, Father, I receive your righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit in my life. And I would take the time to allow righteousness, peace, and joy to find expression in my emotions, in my imagination, in my heart. I would pray the same for my, then extend that to Cami, then to my children, and, and so forth. Uh, when I was learning, and I pray, I'll be honest with you, I'd pray that prayer every single day and get up and just go as hard as I could to have my kingdom and my will get done. <laughs> and it used to astound me that I, I could pray a prayer, but I couldn't live it. Because you can't really can't until you see it and discover, oh, wow, that wasn't my, that was me wanting me, and I cloaked it with a religious slogan, and it really wasn't. Even though I had right words in place, it was still lust and fear and control. And I have to, that's why these aren't prayers that protect us from ourselves. They're prayers that bring us into Christ and show us ourselves. So I'd pray sometimes like, your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. Your day be, your, your day, not my day. But again, as hard as you try, it's a process. There's places where you can say, I remember for a season, I found this scripture in Psalm 142, verse 7, page 30. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. And I pray that for each of my children. And, and I saw the effect of just that simple, Lord, this is your will. Because anything in the Bible is his will. So you don't have to, you, you have liberty to abundantly pray scriptures and, and declarations over the people you love. Prayers will change. Some people will have a focus that you need to really address and you, it's time for really intercession. Other times it's just Thanksgiving. Uh, so there's, and in this little section, but we won't go there today, is there's the revelations of Paul to pray uh, who God is and who we are in Christ and he prayed those prayers. So let's take a moment and we're going to go into praying our priorities. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In a group, you can address wherever you feel. It can be just beginning with yourself or it can be extending to your mate or wherever. And let's just go ahead and do that right now. And I'll join that online group. All right, so your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I desire more than anything, as long as I live, the longer I live, that the kingdom of God would come to me and his will would be done in me. I'm not wanting my way. I used to think I knew what I wanted and I would insist upon what I wanted. And, and it was so hard for me because I had gotten locked into the law and got locked into self-righteousness and religion. Not having ever been in religion, I was a candidate to become religious.
But God is faithful and he allows you to fail in everything that is of you until it returns back to him. Your kingdom come, Father. Your will be done. Not mine. Jesus, you're the king. You are the king and it is your kingdom. So I pray your righteousness, your peace, and your joy. Your righteousness, your peace, and your joy in the Holy Spirit. I feel your righteousness now. I let it breastplate me over my heart, cause me to have that assurance. Everything has been made right through Christ. I have no righteousness for my own. It's only what God has given me, the righteousness of God in Christ. It's all right. Take a breath. Feel the acceptance. Receive his love. You are in the beloved. Accepted. Peace. Oh, I receive your peace. It guards my heart. It guards my mind. It surrounds me. Secures me. Allows me to go to sleep at night in the middle of a storm because the storm doesn't affect my future. What you've spoken over my life is my future. So rather than being anxious in times where I would be, I want to live inside of peace. Your righteousness and peace and joy. Joy. Cheer up, Steve. Cheer up and allow joy to rise up and be my strength. In your presence is fullness of joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. You are my king of righteousness, Melchizedek. And you are king of peace. Another translation for my Melchizedek. And you have been anointed by your God with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So you are the king of joy. Oh, we bless, we receive, we breathe in. And I extend this to my wife, Cammie. And I pray that her journey now continues into Christ and the discovery of his goodness and his love and his mercy and his healing to her body and her joy to her life. And in her moment of caring for her father, who's now dependent on her care and our grandkids and times and joy and pleasure as well as babysitting, that there would come a, a connectivity of, of strength and blessing and provision and breakthrough. And for my kids, Nathan and Christy and Heidi, Jenna and David and their spouses and the six grandchildren and their future spouses and future grandkids, I say, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done. Bring them in. Let the revelation of Jesus Christ come to each and every one of them so that they might respond to you like Paul did at their juncture of time and step into their destiny, their inheritance, and their victory. Spouses, grandkids, everybody. My family, my extended family, my mom is turning 90, and my father-in-law who's turning 88. May kingdom come, may revelation of Jesus, may his righteousness come. To our church, oh Lord, let there be a fresh wind of your spirit. Oh again, may, may Christ be what we are in, entering into. May you dwell deep within us. And may we live inside the new covenant and inside the new creation you've called us to. And Lord, my job as a pastor, please grant me grace and my fellow team members, our staff. May there be a, a unity of the spirit just like it was for Aaron or f as he was anointed that went all over his garment. May we have an anointing of unity and passion and one accordness in Jesus' name. Okay, guys, I'm calling us back. I, and if I can gra gather your attention, so we've got, we're keeping going. I know that we're break, breaking things up, but appreciate. The third session, the third section of prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. I love this. First off, let's look at the obvious. God, if I was writing this prayer, I would probably ask him for an annual income, or at least weekly. But when God was training Israel out of a slave mentality, where they were cared for and told what to do and had no freedom to become who they were called to be, he said, I'm going to put you through a, a life journey, and every day you wake up in the morning, I'll provide the manna. Now, when you see the manna, 
don't lust after it and keep too much because the next day it's going to stink and have worms in it. But on the day of the Sabbath, when you need to rest and not labor, you'll collect enough manna for two days and the bread won't stink and it won't have worms in it. So this, this dependency upon God to be sustained in the planet was to be taught into us and Jesus was saying, give us this day our daily bread. What is the most important thing of daily bread? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, every word out of the mouth of God. So if I'm longing for something, I want to hear God speak to me. Please, let me hear your voice. What is the next thing? Of course, I need your help. It's the specifics. Business, debts, uh, opportunities. We pray our Pray, give us this day. Help us step into that place that we're stepping into, what we're facing. Or healing. Jesus said that healing is the children's bread. So it's a great place to, to allow the Holy Spirit to renovate, renew, regenerate my body. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead gives life to my mortal body. So if I, one of my family members is sick, this is a time to ask for the activation of resurrection life. Other things can be this whole new covenant. You know, he puts his laws in our mind, writes them in our heart. We are never to live by the law again. Yet we have the Bible full of truth, but we cannot take truth and make it a law and promise make it a work. We have to let God put it in our mind and write in our heart. So we, it's, a, it's a time of receiving. Where your kingdom come, your will be done is a time of yielding, a posture of submission, this is a posture of receiving. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, give me, give us this day our daily bread. I, I really need your help. And I'm not looking at it as an obligation that you're under. You're not my ATM. But you are a man that I can trust completely. And you told me that you want to be my source in everything. And you are my source. So I will allow that conversation not a nagging wife when will you do this but a trusting wife that says I know on the mount of the Lord it will be provided when it comes time God will be there and I can trust and hope in Jesus the fact that he raised Jesus from the dead is where my faith rests the hope is that Jesus will bring completion and fruition in everything in my life through his intercession so I can rest in the process. So let's go ahead and practice. And you can pray again over any part of your priorities or just position your own heart to receive your daily bread. And I'll do it with our group online. So, uh, give, me, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. For 40 years, Israel walked through the wilderness they were slaves. Everything was cared for. Sometimes it was good. Most times it wasn't. Now they were learning to gather manna. And the manna wasn't to just take care of them. It was to humble them. And for them to see what was in their own heart. And for them to learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Father, we pray today you would give us your words out of your mouth speak speak over my life and into my life let it be words that are over me they frame my future they speak into my identity they are my current belief reception and experience oh let your word come let your words come also father 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 let your daily bread oh lord I've got debts that are uh, credit cards that are coming due this week. Extensions of faith that I put out there that you gave me faith to believe that I was in agreement with you saying yes to a few things. And now my fear would be that I would get in a place where my credit card, I couldn't pay it off, which I, you've given me f grace to do that every week or every month and use it and then pay it off so it's not occurring interest. And I don't want to go back there, but I don't want to deal with you in a legal issue because there's no reason to. You're my 
Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my provider. So let it be. Bring it forth. I will see you on the mount. You'll see to it. You'll be a provision for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I extend that to my children and especially to the, every one of them in their point of need, whether it's student loans, jobs, transitions in their career. I'm praying that you would be their provider. You would breathe their favor. You'd be their grace. You'd extend your love to them. You would make a way where there is no way. You'd open a door where there is no door to open. Just go ahead. Do it, Father, because you're so good and you're so trusting. And I'm not looking at a system. Like Abraham, you taught me, you're teaching me not to look at the deadness and the impossibility of myself. Not to observe fully my dead body. And neither to take your promise and stagger at it in unbelief or dissect it or separate it thoroughly. But instead to give you glory <laughs> and know and become strong in faith that you're able to perform what you promise. So I bless you, Father. I glorify you, Father. I glorify you in the healing. Oh, let healing abound in our bodies. Let healing abound in my family. Healing abound in our church. Let the waters of healing, let the ministry of Jesus, let the Holy Spirit come. Supply spirit, supply miracles, do it. Because without that, where are we going? We just, oh, we, we're going to just, you know, fall apart on the planet. But you give life to our mortal body. You, you sustain us so we can run the race and finish the course, not get sick, not get impoverished, not put into a bad place. You, Ted, we come out of our crises in health and wealth. And so let it be health, wealth, and well-being to all in my family and all in my heart and all of, my, all of one another. In Jesus' name, Papa. Thank you, Father. Love you, love you, love you, love you. Okay, we'll, we'll keep on going. Now we're going to hit section four, which is probably the hinge of all life and the hinge that opens doors or shuts doors. And it's called, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I like the word debt because it, 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 it gives the idea of something that's owed and ought to be paid but we're choosing not to be paid and not to keep it as a debt. Forgiveness. It's the only place in both Matthew and Luke when Jesus finished the prayer of what we call the Lord's Prayer that he emphasized that when you pray, see that you forgive. Because if you don't forgive, Father won't forgive you. Not because Father's upset about us. We are known inside of forgiveness. Forgiveness only works to us if it's flowing from us. If we withhold forgiveness, forgiveness is withheld. Experientially, we start to live in a kind of distant, separate, legalistic, critical, bitter life. And as soon as we release, all the forgiveness flows back into our life. It wasn't that it was withheld. The unforgiving debtor was only put into the debt prison because he had put his fellow debtor into prison. And he said, okay, if that's the way we do this, then you stay in the prison till you pay your debt. As soon as he forgave that, the possibility would have been if he had forgiven immediately his debtor, then he would have been forgiven his debt. So that's why we often will live through seasons of just anger, hostility, grief, frustration, criticalness, is because we're not in a place where forgiveness is flowing. If your faith's not working, try forgiving. It's, it's where faith stops when forgiveness stops. Forgiveness flows. Where forgiveness flows, life grows. So w doing that in the beginning, and why I believe this so strongly, I would override my carnal thinking by saying this, Father, please forgive me the way I forgive the one I hate the most. I would just do that because I knew my mind would, would justify my unforgiveness as acceptable because of the incident that I was holding. And I still have to do that. Because it's too easy to, to think that, well, uh, that debt is a different kind of debt. No, debt's debt. And forgiveness is releasing somebody, not repackaging it, not refinancing it. When we forgive people, we have to bless them. You have to send them out 
give them the freedom to go repeat the sin, the freedom to repeat the offense, not necessarily to you. We're not meant to be uh, doormats that are supposed to just submit ourselves to abusive things. But neither are we supposed to be policemen and judges putting people into prison and making them pay for the sin they did. We have to release them. Vengeance is mine, God said. It's the one thing. And beloved, the people that are hardest to forgive are the ones closest to us. And they also the ones you cannot exact vengeance on because it's too messy. That's why the Moab, Ammon, Mount Seir were people that were told by God you to Israel, don't touch them. They're cousins. It's too complicated. If I'm going to deal with them, I got to deal with them, but you can't. So that's why the forgiveness is so important in the family. And when you forgive, you release. We take off the negative. We've got to put in the positive. Bless them. Lord, I bless. I forgive. Now I release a blessing. May you prosper them into their life. May you open their eyes to see you. It's like giving your enemy whatever you're longing for in your own life. And when you do that, it, it's, it's cleansing. We, in, in the booklet, you'll see a little later that, that it's... Uh, what happens is if I bless, I'm going to inherit a blessing. So I bless others into their future that I'm forgiving, then blessing, then I'm opening the door to inherit a blessing. Forgiveness, truce, keep short accounts. Jesus said, don't let your wrath, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Another, forgiveness is free. You can give as much of it away. You can forgive an entire nation in your heart. Or you can hold an entire news network in wrath and anger and critical thinking. It's very dangerous to withhold forgiveness when you can freely forgive. Forgiveness is free, so give it away. How do you give it away? Just release it. Jesus said, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Think how much authority we're, lack we're not using by we could be forgiving all kinds of people, all things. But he goes on and he says, uh, forgive until you're free. How do you know? I always think of forgiveness like an antibiotic. You just take it, you use it till you're not sick anymore. How do you know you've forgiven somebody? When you hear their name or the thought returns to your mind or the incident that initiated the problem doesn't twist your gut. Doesn't pull up the root of bitterness. It's not... A root of bitterness is failed grace. It's where grace didn't come out the way you thought it would. And because it didn't, we can then tend to say, well, why should I even try? Why should I even keep myself working hard? And like Esau, we can say, what's the use of holding a birthright when I'm about to die of hunger? And what it opens the door is to most all of our sins as believers, fornication, all of the insanities, because we kind of go, you know, I've been wounded. I've, I've, this didn't work. This didn't come out. And that's where forgiveness, we have to forgive God all the time, ourselves all the time, one another all the time. Unforgiveness is a sin. So you have to not look at it as a friend. Nursing a grudge is nursing the devil. It's opening the door of torment and affliction. Bitter people cannot taste sweet things. If life does not bring sweetness, then it, it shows me my bitterness. Now, I used to say, don't get bitter, get broken. Life happens, don't get bitter. What I've decided is that most of the time, life happens, I get bitter. Then I get broken. And then I surrender. And I come back into, oh, the waves of forgiveness. See, the more you forgive... The more you need to be forgiven, the more you can forgive. If you live in a righteous mindset like Simon the, the Pharisee, all we do is judge. We criticize everybody. In our mind, we have a conversation with what they're saying. And so the woman who's sinful comes and washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. The Pharisee's thinking, this man can't possibly be a prophet because he would know what kind of a person's touching him. And Jesus has to say, who loves more? The one who's been forgiven $10 million dollars or the one that was forgiven $10,000. And they said, well, I suppose the one who was forgiven the greater debt. And he said, exactly. He said, I came to your house to have a meal. You didn't kiss me. 
You didn't hug me. You didn't wash my feet. And yet this woman has done all of that. You've criticized. You, you judged me. You, you, you see the picture. So when I'm tight, it's always because I'm not being forgiven. And when I'm not being forgiven, it's usually because I don't think I need to be forgiven. And I've become the Pharisee. My prayer is more like, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything. And I thank God I'm not like the rest of the world. And that is self-righteousness. It stinks in the nostrils of God. It doesn't even get out of the, it doesn't even get above the roof. You don't get heard, we don't get heard. So then we live in self-righteous. We have to perpetuate, oh, well, I'm doing this, and I'm not doing that, and I'm not that kind of person, and I'm not going to be that person. But we're miserable. We're jealous of our neighbor when they buy a new car. We are not in debt, but we don't have a new car. They ought to, you know, it just, it tells on us. So this is a, such an important part. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. Repentance is the door opener to faith, God's love and true worship. We'll go ahead and get into this one. Let it be uh, just an honest asking to for be forgiven and a possible extension of forgiveness. And see if this doesn't unclog the heart and unclog, this, unclog the connectivity of God. And we'll go ahead and let's break up in groups. I'll gather with our online team. Okay, wow. Oh man, forgive me, Father, as I forgive those who are indebted to me. I am indebted to you. I have spent more of my life trying to be righteous than I spent my life trying to live for myself as a sinner. And yet, <laughs> all that trying to be righteous was still living for me. I've hurt more people than I can ever imagine. I've put more pressure on people. I, I was the self-righteous Pharisee. I judged everybody. I made it impossible. I was exacting, and you know it. I did it to my children. I did it to my wife. I've done it to my church over and over and over again. Well, I didn't even think I was. So today I just humble myself, and I repent. I bow my knee. <laughs> I'm so sorry, and I know you forgive me. At the same time, now I have to extend forgiveness, and I want to, to everyone that's now doing what they got to do. They're doing their thing, and they're causing me pain. And yeah, I had an answer for that before. It was called control. I would stop you from doing what you're doing, or I'd remove you from my life so you couldn't do it to me. And now you told me I can't do that. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to forgive and allow forgiveness. So I don't know how that works, but it, I have to experience forgiveness to forgive. And if I choose to forgive, it can open me to receive new forgiveness. So I'm, I'm in on this. And oh, it's scary. It is scarier than anything I do is forgiving because I'm releasing someone to their own free will to go do whatever they feel that they need to do. You forgave the unforgiving debtor and he went to take advantage of his new liberty by putting somebody else into captivity. That's just so wrong, but it was so me. I'm so bad, God, I don't want to do that. I release, and I ask you to forgive me, and forgive me. And I forgive all who are in current conflict with me, who are standing in opposition to what I want. Maybe they're not really my opposition. Maybe it's you're my opposition. Maybe my pride's what you're standing against. Maybe the dream I think I have isn't a dream at all. Maybe I'm Balaam, sitting there in this kind of access to God, but lust of my own future. I, I, how can I know? I want to hear the donkey speak. I don't want to beat the donkey and tell him you're a bad donkey. Because if life's not working, it's not, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I'm the problem. So release me into forgiveness, I pray. And I forgive those who are in conflict with me, in conflict with you, and I ask that there would be an extension. Do it across our country. Do it across the politicized church that has been divided against each other. Do it across the nations that are in conflict and the ish, Islam with, with Judaism and all of, oh Lord, let there be, may the Prince of Peace, the Healer, the Deliverer come in Jesus' name and bring forgiveness. Ah. <sighs> Let me forgive me. 
and I forgive you. You don't owe me anything, Papa. You gave me everything in your son. I am not in need of anything but your son. And I don't want law promises to become debts, and I don't want grace to become works and it is and I just have to return every day and return I forgive me I forgive you I forgive everybody and I receive forgiveness for everything I've done thank you thank you thank you you're so good you're so good in Jesus name amen okay let's keep going I know this one could really open up and it's some of my best times with God is in this this place of forgiveness Two more, and then we're going to close up. We're, we're on time. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I have to be honest. When I began this prayer, this was probably the least important part. But now it's the most important part. I said, oh, Lord, if there's any way I can miss that test, I know the outcome. I fail. I know what I'll do. I'll do me. And I'll do it again, and I don't want to do it again. I want to back out of it. Please, lead me not into temptation. God doesn't lead us in temptation. We lead ourselves. James is very clear with that. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, he's being tempted by God. But all men are tempted when their lust conceived. Now, lust is the opposite of, it's the fruit of fear, which is the opposite of love. Fear, lust, it says, I better make sure I get this. I need to get this. If I don't take matters into my own hands, what might happen? I don't know if I can trust God here. What about that friend, that coworker? They're, they're working to try to take my job position. I'm going to have to step up and come up with my own strategy. That's fear, lust. You know, it leads to corruption. It leads to decay. It leads to destruction. Love, on the other hand, says, I'm going to believe. I'm going to trust. God will see to my future. And if I'm, to, if I'm to die, I die. I don't have to try to prevent or protect or promote. I'm just going to allow God to be. And so it leads me to a level of trust and forgiveness and the opportunity to receive life. Now the devil is there pushing on us, trying to tell us, hey, you better do something here. You better prove something here. If you are the Son of God, prove it. And that is probably the hardest thing, especially as men, to not be in competition and be challenged and try to force at the upper hand. So Jesus made it clear, take a moment and pray and close the prayer time from not being tempted. We can use prayer to get our own way and that it won't be heard. We pray our lust. Yet he gives more grace to the humble. This is that place where, for me now, I'm, it's almost like I say every day, Oh, Father Jesus, I want to now bow the knee to the king. First thing I want to do is humble myself. You have committed yourself to resist me. You have made it clear that you as God creator, Father, will resist every attitude, action, thought of pride. But you will give grace to the humble. So I want to humble myself James says, in the sight of God, that he might lift me up. And I want to humble myself, as Peter said, under the mighty hand of God, that he might raise me up in due season. An opportune time. Humility is probably what we, have, we come into this. Lord, I need you. I won't be able to do this without you. Please, 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 don't let me be a jerk again. I am a jerk. See, I can't stop being a jerk. You leave, leave me alone, I'll be a jerk. But give me love. Fill me with your hope. Hear my prayer. I'm going to seek your face. I have to seek your face so I can turn from my wicked ways because all I have is wicked ways, but your face is life. It's where the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. The armor of God is a beautiful place. Uh, it, is, it, it is a time once I think humility has been enacted that we can say to the devil, let go of me. Loose me. You have no authority over me because of Jesus Christ. My righteousness is in Christ. His blood is what answers the accusation that's tormenting me right now. And his words to me is my testimony, which is the future that I have in him. And 
I'm not going to take care of my soul in this matter. Soul, I'm sorry. I'd like to rescue you. But you don't really want me to rescue you because you'll just be fear fearful forever. So just let it go. I'm not going to love you, soul, even to the point of death. We're just going to let God have to take care of you. And this is... Oh, it's, there's one last thing I want to say with this. Is that the opposite spirit of self-assertion is glorification of God and thanksgiving and gratitude. To be grateful for the life where you are. See, this isn't, even when he said, um, and there's some really good stuff about the five sins that we all face as men and all face as believers. And there's some really good stuff in further on that just uh, how, to, how to get out of, how to find the way. The promise is in all, no temptation has overtaken us, but such is common to man. And with all temptation, God is faithful to make a way of escape. Now, I used to think that was a door out of the problem. But what I've discovered took me a long time to figure this out. I couldn't get out of the problem. The harder I tried, the further the guy went in. Then I discovered that there's actually a door in the middle of trouble. It's on the floor. The Valley of Achor, I'll give you the door of hope. Hope is Jesus Christ. He is the better hope. So the door, the, the ability to endure a temptation, didn't say escape it, endure it. To get through it to the other side for the purpose for which God allowed you to go in and the purpose for which you forced yourself in. Whatever. Stupidity or sovereignty, it's the same thing. The door into hope is into Christ. So the, to, to come into this place with gratitude and thanksgiving, say, Lord, I know there's a reason. If you want me out, I'll be out. And if I'm not out, you must have a value with me being here. If you don't want this relationship to change, you must have a value for me to find you in the midst of an unhealthy relationship. If you've told me that I'm to be in a job that's a dead end and you're not giving me a way out, you must have a place for me to find you inside a job that's a dead end without a way out. And you know when you've found your way into Christ, you smile, you have a feast, and you begin to be grateful. Lord, I am so glad that you put me in here, left me here, and would never release me from here so that I could find you. And now that I found you, I'm having a feast. There's a table here before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm fellowshipping ways I never would have. It's just this uh, releasing into Christ. That's the way, the door of hope. That's the way of escape so we can endure the life we're in until the life of Christ has overwhelmed us and we begin to influence the place we're at. Not by forceful change, but for deliverance, attitudes, peace, joy, and all that starts to flood into the place. So let's take a time, and we're, this is, we're keeping up with ourselves. Groups go, and I'll begin with our online audience. Bless you, Jesus. I thank you, Father. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. When I, I don't know. Man, I just get up and do me over and over and over again. It's just me, me, me. I don't want to be me. But I can't delete me. I am me. I can only submit me to you. Thank you. I submit me. I can't fix me. I can't repair me. I can't erase me. I can't renew me. I just submit me. Lead me not into temptation. I, help me to enter into submission and peace and quietness and humility. I humble myself. I bow my knee to the king. And I pray. And I want to have an honest appraisal of me. I don't want to be the Pharisee that says, I fast twice a week and give tithes of all. I want to be this... The tax collector to say, no, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm so grateful that I do know that you forgive me. But I want to live in forgiveness. I don't want to live in righteousness of my own. I want to live in being absolutely dependent upon Jesus Christ, King, Lord, Deliverer.
I don't want to try to get to a place that's mine merited or mine supported. I don't want to promote anything, provide for any of it. I don't want to produce any of it. I just want to praise and submit and rest in you. Father, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. He is too strong for me. For he's too wily. He understands the methodology of fear and lust and control. He's an accuser, a traducer. He's a deceiver. I'm no match for him. I don't want to engage. I humble myself. I humble myself. But I also have authority. So in the name of Jesus, where you where the darkness has encroached and said, I will rule. I say, no, you will not rule. Jesus Christ is Lord. And even the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Because we are, I am, all of us are, brands plucked from the fire, but we are delighted in by the Lord and loved fiercely. So love will drive out the fear, and the fear will no longer lead to my lust and my lust into corruption, but the love that is poured into me will lead to faith and faith to trust, forgiveness, and freedom. Hallelujah. I thank you. Wherever I'm in life that changes not, then grace is sufficient. Wherever I cannot get myself out of a problem is because you want to be the strength for me in the problem. I find Jesus. I choose you, Jesus. I choose you in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Okay, I'm sorry to keep shortening our time, but we have 12... 11 more minutes. So let's close this prayer and then we will um, do one more thing. And I'm not sure I didn't tell anybody, but I do want us to receive an offering or have buckets up here. And I'll explain that after this, this section. Um, so the last, and I'll, I'll, now that I said that, I don't want to lose your concentration. The reason for an offering is not because this book isn't put in your hand. And we didn't, I don't want to charge you. Now, I don't, the money isn't the key. The key is the value you place on this. If you place, this is your future. Now some of it rudimentary and you already are way over it, but where, what of this union do you want and what is it worth and what is it valuable? Faith is the key of transmission. It is in the words we hear in this life of prayer, and in the life of giving. Tithing is a key. So it's, it's so much a part of us submitted to sovereignty and trust and honoring Melchizedek, our king, our righteous priest, Jesus, and honoring him with the first, not the second, not the third. Offerings are where we endeavor our faith beyond what is already his. You see, I don't think you can give an offering if you haven't tithed. Because the tithe is what God says, that's mine. Just, just so you know, you're blessed. I want my tenth. I, and then you do whatever you need to do with the 90. And I promise you, you'll have 110% success with the 90% versus 100%. But that's a faith thing. So if you, today, if something's stirring, Faith in finances unlocks futures. Just good news, guys. We were $13,000 year to date as of May 1st in debt as a church. Sunday, we gather, and I put the plea out that we were, for, we were close to still 15000 less than we were going to break even for the month. We, our goal is 80000 And... We were, I, I think we were at 48 or 54, something like that. <clears throat> and we, took, we received an offering. And if that had been the offering, we would have been further into debt. We would have been, I don't know, because I don't have all those figures clear. But what happened is God moved in one man and put faith in them. And I'm sharing this story because this is what's going to start breaking the kingdom into new dimensions. The faith of one man. And that God stirred that one man and said, if tell, tell them, tell the pastor to take another offering, and if you take another offering, I will double it. Whatever was put in the money, I will pay for it. I'll double it. 
So, of course, I did. The Spirit had been already all over this service. We'd done so many different things. And out of that doubling, we came up above our 80,000 to 85,000. And of the 13,000 debt that we had as we began May 1st, we now began June 1st with only $1,000 in the red year to date. You believe it? Yeah. But God kept saying to me, the faith of one man, the faith of one man, the faith of one man. It's like Abraham. Everything that's going to change the world starts with just a man and faith. So if we will receive as we worship after we close this, and I do believe this is, this is the key to the future. I feel the Lord on that. And I am so grateful for the fact that we've miraculously brought ourselves back up. And I felt like the Lord kind of winked at me when I was trying to just roughly work the figure num numbers out. I said, I, I, could, I could have put you 10,000 above. But then you just go back to indifference. I want faith. I want men believing. I want men hearing me and saying yes to me and making it a part of their future, their life. To me, tithing is like praying. And I used to tithe just me mechanically. Now I make it a point of worship. And the first I do so I can give to him, I go, Lord Jesus, you're seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, Melchizedek, my high priest. And right now I give to you this, your tenth, your tithe. And I receive your blessing upon my life because I will not be able to go out into the future without your blessing. But you are the one who blesses me. I have promise, but I need blessing for promise to fulfill. So I receive your, inter your interactive blessing, intercession, and sacrifice, and redemption, and completeness. And so here, receive it. I'm going to just take a moment. I, I can text the tide now, so I can do it right when I have the money cleared and it's in the bank. And then I just pause. And I know the rest of the day, it may, it may be too little at the end of the month. Sometimes there's more than I need, and sometimes there's, I, I'm in need. But I am in covenant, and I'm in trust, and I come back, and I can return, and I'm learning to do that. He, it's not a system. It's a man. It's a king who, who just will always extend his worth as we value it. That's why we call it worship, worth-ship. So let's finish this, because here we are in the last one, and then we'll close with worship, and you can bring an offering up front, and if you're online, do the same. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he reaps, and wherever he sows to, he reaps from. So let's sow where we want to reap from, and let's sow what we're longing for. So this statement, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, is the place we began with praise, and now we end with praise. We hallowed the name, and now we just exalt the king, the righteousness, peace. Let's go ahead. If you can take me out, let's be in our group one more time, one more time. Let's just take a moment, go around, each of us. I'm going to speak to our online group now. So here we are, Lord Jesus, I rejoice in who you are. I praise you. It's your kingdom. It's your power. It's your glory forever and ever. It's your kingdom. It's your power. It's your glory forever and ever and ever. Your kingdom, your power, your glory. You know, I don't know, gosh. Man, I love you. I'm so grateful to have a relationship with you. I'm so thankful that more and more I don't think about a system of belief or a concept or a practice. I think about a kingdom with a king. And it is your kingdom and your righteousness and your peace, your joy. And, and I just praise you. I will be cared for. I will be loved. I will be led into the future. I will... But that isn't about me. It's all about you, you glorious king. You're my king. I love you. 
and praise you. Yours, it's your kingdom, your power, your glory. May you be re received. Wow, sometimes it's so scary to follow you. Most of the time it's so scary to follow you. I don't even know how to, I, how do I conduct myself? I have to have you, my priest, to hold me in place. Not because I'm going to fall out, but I just don't know how to hold myself. But I don't need to hold myself. I get to be held by you. I am in Christ. Thank you. It's your kingdom. You're the king. And your kingdom, your king, your Christ, your Lord, your savior, your deliverer, your redeemer. You're our blessing. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. We've got two more minutes, so can we all stand together? We're going to just worship. I want to bless you to send you out on your day. I want to thank you for being a, an active family. Father, in Jesus' name, it is my greatest pleasure, and I so thank you for even the honest truth of that vulnerability in our prayer and amongst one another. Lord, this has been a such a long season as we all learn to let go. And running into me has been the hardest part of life because I tried to cover it up every time. I would be more righteous the next time. I would be more focused the next time. It would be eliminate my competition, remove problems, but yet none of it None of it ever made a difference. I don't get anywhere until you release me. I don't become anything until you succeed in conquering me. And I become utterly, completely dependent on you. That is the foundation of my life is you. I have no other one. I long to escape so many times. I've come up with other attitudes and places to be. I put so much harm on so many people just because I'm afraid and trying to protect. But you just know what you're doing. And we're going to all be yours. We're going to all live in love and love and trust. And we're not going to be afraid. There's only one body. And there's only one spirit. And there's only one hope of our calling. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all overall and through us all so Lord we submit ourselves to you and Jesus to the prayer you taught this ancient path activate it in our daily life until it becomes inside in, into we into, into interwoven into our prayer into our heart into our response take possession of all the things that ours that we submit to you bring us into all of the experiences that each of these places in prayer bring us to and activate this prayer and multiply it online and multiply it as a school and a place of growth until you have a praying church that is larger than anything you've ever seen and certainly we've ever seen release this anointing Lord we say a simple prayer Lord teach us to pray can we say that together? Lord, teach us to pray. One more time. Lord, teach us to pray. Bless the offering. Bless this future as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen.